Well, hello, everybody. Welcome again to another legislative recap. I'm Lieutenant Governor David Zuckerman. We've been holding these roundtable conversations throughout the spring and summer on a wide range of issues. And the more recent ones have been around the whirlwind of bills that passed near the end of the legislative session, particularly around COVID and CARES Act money and how those resources are being used in every different sector of society. Today, we're going to be talking about agriculture and food systems and the working lands industry as a whole. If you've missed past conversations on the climate, school reopening, uh, other aspects of CARES funding, housing, and so forth, uh, you can find those videos on the events page of my website, Zuckerman4VT.com. Today, I've got three great folks joining me, uh, Representative Carolyn Partridge. She's the chair of the House Committee on Agriculture and Forestry. She's from parts of Wyndham County, I think six or seven towns, Rockingham, Athens, Brookline, and a number of others, so she'll tell us all those. Uh, Senator Anthony Polina from um, Washington County. He serves on the Senate Committee on Agriculture. And also Graham Unarnst Rufinock, hope I pronounced that right, the Policy Director for Rural Vermont, mm -hmm. uh, who has been in the State House quite a bit on different advocacy around a range of issues for uh, our rural agricultural and rural forestry um, parts of the state, which of course is the vast majority of the state. I do want to um, welcome all three of you. Thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having us. Thank you, David. So um, I do want to remind those watching, those who have watched others of these know that I regularly indicate that participation by our guests on these, in these conversations does not necessarily constitute an endorsement. Uh, we also want to invite folks that if you have questions or thoughts, please post them in the comments section on Facebook. We will try to bring them in either now or uh, we'll make sure to get back to you with answers to those questions uh, and comments at some point in the near future. Uh, we're going to start our conversation by talking about dairy. Dairy is still the most uh, widely asked aspect of our agricultural economy. Uh, for those that don't know, Vermont is the um, state that has the most dependence on a single commodity in its agri in an agricultural sector. Most states have two or three or four big things. And in Vermont, uh, when I was first in the legislature, I think it was almost as much as 85% of agricultural receipts were dairy. That did include maple in many of the ways they calculated it, because a lot of the dairies have maple in uh, operations. Now it's closer to 70%, and there's a couple reasons for that. I think partly we are seeing lower milk prices, and so that means the dollars are smaller. Uh, we have a similar number of cows, but we also have far more diverse farms showing up and doing different kinds of production from different kinds of animals to more vegetables and so forth. So um, let's, but we are gonna start by talking about dairy. Um, it is the big, you know, normally you say elephant in the room, we'll say the big cow in the room. Uh, so let's talk about how it's faring, what the challenges they're facing, uh, maybe what's gone on for the last four or five years and that glimmer of hope just before COVID. Uh, and so I'm going to turn actually to uh, Chair Partridge first, uh, just having been chair of the committee for many years about uh, following these things. What's the status of dairy? And then maybe what are some of the things that are going on today uh, in the fallout of COVID? Well, thanks, David. Uh Dairy has really taken a huge hit over the last five years. Uh, we typically saw historically a kind of a, a three-year roller coaster ride where prices would be high and then they'd go down. And farmers were able to save during the, um, <coughs> the times of uh, higher milk prices and then um, sort of be able to weather the storm. But this has just been... Um, you know, five years of low milk prices. There have been attempts to offer uh, milk margin protection programs and what have you, but uh, farms are really struggling. Um, and this includes organic as well. So although organic milk prices have been higher and that's a good thing. So this uh, COVID situation has just been devastating because schools, universities, uh, other food service programs have closed. Milk was no longer, uh, no longer had the kind of demand that it needed. And so um, there was a, a bit of milk dumping that went on that is tragic. I mean, imagine throwing your stuff out. Um, the things, you know, the product that you've worked so hard for 
Um, and we've lost farms. And I don't know what the exact count is at this point, but I'm going to guess that we're in the neighborhood of 650 dairy farms that are left. When I started in the legislature, I think there were over you know, 2,000. That was 22 years ago. So we've seen a huge hit. And for the most part, it's been the small and medium-sized farms that have, uh, have really suffered. So um, we put together a bill. Uh, it was, well, the Senate actually started S-351, and it provides $25 million for, uh, for dairy. 21.2 of that uh, is for uh, producers, which, you know, farmers, et cetera. And 3.8 is for the uh, processors. And if you have, you know, I'll end here because I want others to get in on the conversation, but, uh, but that is where we're at. And the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets is very, uh, working very hard. They're, they're taking um, the applications as we speak and um, they are, um, I, I spoke with Diane Bothfield yesterday and one of the things that she's hearing is, oh, there won't be money, there won't be enough money for me. Yes, there will. So please apply. If you've experienced losses or expenses, please apply for this money. It's really important that you do. Anthony, do you have um, some thoughts you want to add around what's going on with some of the dairy industry? Sure. Thanks a lot for having us, David. I appreciate it. You know, you mentioned early on that Vermont is heavily dependent on dairy. We're more heavily dependent on dairy than any other state is dependent on one particular crop. Unfortunately, from this point of view, being heavily dependent on dairy, dairy is very volatile when it comes to pricing. There's many ups and downs. We're all familiar with hearing about it over the years, milk prices below the cost of production. Imagine having a business where you produce a product, then you have to sell it for less than you've actually paid to produce it. It's been really tough over the years and it's just gonna get tougher. It's also important to keep in mind that, you know, we talk about how the schools were shut down, restaurants were shut down, whatever it might be, businesses were shut down. We never called for the shutdown of farms, obviously. You know, what happened was that farmers lost their markets. We t you've heard in the past how a very small surplus would make a big difference to farmers. If there's a surplus of two to three percent, five percent milk surplus, it drives down milk prices. That's been the case for years, but now what's happened this time is when the markets dried up, when kids stopped going to schools, when restaurants stopped buying cheese and dairy products, it made, meant that there was a huge surplus on the market for milk as well, and bigger than ever seen in the past. And that drove prices down dramatically. So the numbers were really unfathomable to talk to dairy farmers and have, have them tell you that they're losing like tens and tens of thousands of dollars every week. It's just hard to imagine how you could keep going under that kind of pressure. But we need to find a way to stabilize the dairy industry, perhaps doing some kind of in-state um, price mechanism that helps us create stability for the dairy farmers in the state. But this COVID-19 has really been the last straw for a lot of them who just don't understand why they should continue to produce something and then have to sell it at such a low price. So it's been really, really hard for dairy farmers particularly. It's been hard for other farmers as well, non-dairy farmers, which we'll talk more about in a bit, I'm sure. Thank you. And uh, Graham, do you have any thoughts about some of the farms you've worked with? I know uh, you, rural Vermont tends to sometimes be focused on some of the smaller farms, but uh, what are you seeing out there? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I think we certainly agree with the context that um, Senator Kalina and Representative Partridge just laid out for dairy and commodity dairy specifically in general. Um, you are right, um, Lieutenant Governor, that we work a lot with the dairy community and with smaller dairy farms, but also with, with commodity conventional organic dairy farms and with NOFA Vermont and organizations like the Champlain Valley Farmers Association as well and, and the other um, watershed alliance groups at times. But I think what I'd really like to draw attention to in respect to dairy um, for this call and for the upcoming session um, is um, the, the migrant workers who are staffing and, and who are the farmers essentially at many of these dairy operations. And um, every Vermont citizen this spring and this summer received $1,200 per person, $500 per child and COVID relief money. Um, none of our migrant community members without status received this funding. And um, so one of our primary asks, along with Migrant Justice and a number of other organizations for the Vermont Legislature for this August and September session, is to approve a $5 million uh, for this community to ensure that each individual and family receives that same benefit as have other residents in Vermont. And the dairy industry really relies on these folks. And uh, I think one of the main visions we need to all have and share for agricultural future in Vermont is one which is equitable 
and just. So I'll, I'll leave it there. And I think that you know, we could talk about dairy for a long time uh, here as well. We could. We're going we're gonna to go for about 45 minutes. So we won't go too deep in every single one of these things. But uh, COVID-19 has made us all much more aware of how the different sectors of our economy and state are connected. Uh, as many know, our tourism is related to our agriculture uh, and, and many, many other factors. Uh, and a few weeks ago, I held a press conference uh, about a program called Everyone Eats that was part of the uh, CARES Act COVID relief money. This program was supported by about five million of those dollars. And the money goes to the restaurants that were otherwise gonna be shutting down to keep their uh, folks employed uh, as well as to use their employees to produce meals. And my understanding is it'll be about 18,000, 19,000 meals a week, all the way through December for people who are hungry. And those restaurants are not only gonna keep their employees working, but they're also going to be buying some of their uh, inputs, some of the produce or some of the meat, some of their ingredients from local farms. And the idea was that the money would be spent many times over within our society within our state so that we could stretch these COVID dollars farther to helping our economy. So um, we're gonna take a few minutes to talk about our, the state of our food systems, non-dairy farms and farm markets, and maybe what challenges and opportunities do you see in this particular sector? And I might go in the reverse order, uh, Graham, you know, what are you seeing in, in the diversified agriculture sector? What are farmers doing and are they, are they having challenges with wholesale to the restaurants, many that they used to sell to? And might this kind of program be helpful to some of them? Yes, thank you. Um, you know, we're hearing diversity of things from producers. Um, you know, non-dairy farmers certainly aren't a monolith, as as we've discussed before. And um, certainly, markets disruption for folks who are selling to restaurants, institutions, um, folks who are traveling out of state and selling out of state markets. Um, so we've seen a dramatic sort of resilience and ability of, of these small diversified farms to really step up and and re. Um, tool their markets for for local local residents of Vermont, um, and I think you know one of the, the primary points and asks we're going to be making in relationship to support for the non dairy sector um, in Vermont this this coming session is to go back and, and do some corrective actions to this five million dollars put aside um, by the state. Currently, there's a there's some significant disparity between. Um, the dairy program, the non-dairy program, and, and equity, severe equity concerns. And we've heard back from producers that this program could be very challenging for them. So what we'd like to see is the, the non-dairy farms are currently required to prove they had no net profit in order to qualify for any of this $5 million in relief funds, whereas dairy farms must only prove any economic harm, which could be any expenses or losses related to COVID. So we're asking the legislature to address this explicit inequity and ensure that non-dairy farms are held to the same economic harm qualifier. And there's also a rollover date in September, currently on September 15th, after which non-dairy money that has not been allocated is gonna be reversed to the dairy fund. Um, currently, this application hasn't even rolled out yet. So we feel it's uh, unrealistic for, to expect farmers to be able to apply within this window. Um, and we would ask that this date be removed and that there be no rollover to the dairy dairy fund and that this money just simply be put aside for folks. Um, we've heard a lot about farmers markets and, you know, we work with NOFA and the Agency of Agriculture to pro uh, process applications and distribute $14,000 to 32 farmers markets to help them come into compliance to operate during COVID. Um, and I think what we'd like to see for farmers markets going forward as well is some more equity in terms of how they're treated with other grocery and market outlets. We've heard a lot from folks who have lost a significant amount of their income from the markets due to what they see as overly restrictive guidelines, especially compared with other grocery outlets. So I'll leave it there and let other folks go. Yeah, I'm gonna to go to Carolyn next and, and maybe after Anthony, I'll add a little bit about the farmer's markets just from my own experience, but uh, Carolyn, your thoughts. Uh, thanks, David. Um, I, I really understand a lot of uh, what Graham's points were. Uh, I'm actually one of those non-dairy farmers and uh, I've lost a huge chunk of my income for this year, and I know it's gone. I think that there are some farmers who might actually do better because they have um, the opportunity to take advantage of people's interest in local food. And if they can pivot quickly enough, they might be able to produce uh, what folks are looking for. Uh, 
but I've lost the Maryland and New York sheep and wool festivals. And those are huge for me because uh, I'm a sheep farmer. I raise sheep for not only meat, which will continue, but, uh, and, and probably do well, but I already sell all the lamb I possibly can produce. Uh, but all of my yarn sales and, and fiber sales that I would have gained at, in Maryland and New York are um, non-existence. So, so, and I take the point about the cutoff for this. Um, one of my biggest shows, the New York Sheep and Wool Festival happened the third weekend in October. And that's not gonna count as a loss for me at this point. So um, I'm not opposed to going back and sort of reworking things, not for my own benefit, but for, for everybody's. Um, and I, I think I'll, um, I'll kind of leave it there. I, I, I think that there are folks who are gonna do better. I don't know about reapportioning the money. Uh, we know that dairy is taking a huge hit. And uh, I will add that, you know, as a small sheep farmer, uh, you know, dairy has always been really helpful to me. I have one dairy farm left in my district now. Uh, and I've watched this transition as when our baler breaks, for instance, uh, I used to be able to drive 45 minutes over to, you know, Walpole, New Hampshire and go to R.N. Johnson. That closed. Then uh, I would drive to Keene, New Hampshire uh, to go to Keats. And now if a part breaks, I have to drive up to Randolph or to Middlebury. And that's almost, you know, it's a one and three quarter hour trip. So dairy is really important to some of that external uh, infrastructure that we have taken, we as small farmers have taken advantage of. Um, so I don't want to discount of the needs of dairy. I fought for dairy in this whole process. Um, and uh, knowing that non-dairy would need money as well. So I'm going to leave it there. Thanks. Anthony, you've got some thoughts on this? Well, I think you're muted, Anthony. There you go. Yep. You're good. Okay, sorry about that. But I want to go back to one of the first things you said when you were introducing this little piece of conversation. You talked about restaurants going to work, producing food for people who are hungry. But I think it's really important to keep in mind that food is culture and food is society. And I really worry not only about the farmers, but I really do worry about restaurants as well. It's such a foundation for our local communities. And I hope that we can find ways to make sure that our restaurants can come back from COVID-19 because a lot of them are really deep in debt because they've had to close down. I think that's really important to keep in mind how important they are to our local culture. Um, I think that I, I want to say that I agree with what Graham was saying about needing to correct some problems with the non-dairy section of the proposal of the bill. And also keeping in mind that while the dairy part went out pretty quickly, the Ag Department put together the grant program for dairy farmers and it's, it's uh, out there, it's an operation that the non-dairy piece has not really been put into operation yet. I think that's really unfortunate. There was a feeling early on among some people that dairy, well, dairy was in big trouble that, in fact, non-dairy farmers, vegetable growers and all were doing okay because the COVID-19 crisis made people appreciate local foods more. And so CSAs were more popular than ever before, that kind of thing. But we have to keep in mind that, not every, not every vegetable farmer or fruit grower could actually pivot fast enough to take advantage of the new, new markets and new interest in local food. Not everybody has a website, not everybody has a CSA, not everybody has a farm market stand on their farm. So that's why the non-dairy section is really important to provide support for farmers who are trying to pivot as best they can to meet the demands of the new markets. I also want to point out that the original proposal from the governor, as I remember, unless I'm missing something, the original proposal from the governor didn't include any money for non-dairy farmers at all. It was all about dairy. So there were times when people would write to us as legislators and say, we understand that you're cutting back on the governor's proposal to provide support to dairy. And there's some truth to that. But that was because we recognized that not just dairy farmers, but all farmers needed support as they go through these changes. And so we've made it really imperative that we put money into non-dairy farmers as well. I also want to you talk more about this yourself from your experience, but I think there was a lot of controversy early on about this uh, shutdown of farmers markets. And I had a hard time understanding why it was okay to go into a grocery store where you're inside and there's other people in there and there's food from all over the country, people working, people shopping, but there was, it was considered too dangerous to go to a farmer's market, which is outdoors and locally based. So I think there's, you know, we made some missteps early on. I think we're going to get back on track. And I think it's really important to keep in mind that non-dairy farmers are really the, one of the backbones of our agricultural economy and our open landscape. And we have to really make sure that we 
put together a program that actually meets the needs of non-dairy farmers as well as dairy farmers. Well, those are, are helpful points all the way around. I, uh, speaking from my own experience with our farm, our CSA interest did grow, although distributing CSAs is quite a bit more work now, because again, we're pre-packing everyone's shares and with a couple hundred shares, that's quite a bit of work compared to folks being able to just go pick what they wanted and, and uh, so forth. Um, and at the farmer's market, definitely the Burlington farmer's market, which used to have six, seven, 8,000 people over the course of a day, and that probably was too many people for density, even with it being outside uh, to Senator Polina's point. Um, now it's about 1,500 to 2,000 work their way through. Uh, and it is uh, tricky. Um, I know some of the smaller stands are typically holding their own. I heard one farm doing as well, if not slightly better than past years. Our farm is down about 70 to 75% just because we can only have two employees at the stand and we can't put the produce out for people. So every farm is different. Uh, I think it's really important and really hard for the legislators because every dairy is different in scale and, and systems. Every non-dairy farm is different in scale and systems. So there is no one size fits all approach, uh, but it's very helpful when folks like Graham come in representing different farms. Uh, there's folks from the Farm Bureau, there's other uh, dairy interests there, and they help folks like Representative Partridge and Senator Polina and the others on the Ag Committees try to find a balance with not enough resources. Um, I'm gonna take a final pivot to uh, our working lands economy. David, could I have... add? Oh yeah, please, Representative. David, I, I just wanna add something because uh, we Absolutely. talk about the five million for non-dairy ag, but there are other bills that had other chunks of money, and I want to make sure that people know about some of them. Uh, for instance, in H961, there was a million dollars set aside for economic loss and expenses due to the pandemic, uh, and that is going to be, it was uh, given to working lands, it's going to be administered through the Agency of Ag. There's in, in 966, there was um, 2.5 million for working lands. That was money that was going to be given to uh, the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, uh, but they are going to be working with an MOU uh, with ag to distribute that money. There's money for, um, through the cap agencies, I think there's $1.4 million for sole proprietors. Uh, and then there was a, a C, um, the community development block grant, $1.53 million to small proprietors. I think that's gonna close out very soon, but that's a lottery. Um, and so I'm not gonna go into detail on some of these, but I think it's important that people know that there are a bunch of different ways they could um, recoup some of their losses through other um, uh, means other than just 351, which had the 5 million for non-dairy ag. Right. There's and, also and money for forestry as well. Great. Yeah. And we're going to go into a little bit of that in this next question. Uh, and so I look forward to getting a few more details from all of you on these other sections. I can also say at first, the federal PPP program was not particularly accessible to agricultural operations, but they changed that. So farms that have employees, uh, there, there's the opportunity to, uh, there was the opportunity, I think it's been extended to apply for a payroll protection plan so that some uh, offset of losses would be possible. Um, so I'm gonna speak briefly about um, the working lands economy. Uh, Representative Partridge just uh, spoke briefly to that and we'll get into a little more detail. Uh, and working lands economy includes not only the agricultural operations in terms of dairy or diversified vegetables and meats, but there's also forestry, uh, which includes maple and wood products. And then of course, restaurants and other businesses that rely on all of these products from the working lands. I've seen restaurants that have, you know, Vermont wood on their walls or their tables, as well as buying products like maple or vegetables or meat or milk and cheese. Uh, and so all of these different businesses, all these different sectors are part of the working lands uh, economic model. This even includes outdoor parks and recreational businesses that again, if you go out into our parks, you see across our landscape, which is often the working lands. So what role does our working lands economy play and what challenges and opportunities is it facing right now uh, in terms of some of these other sectors? Um, there is money and Representative Partridge just talked about some of that. I was gonna first go to Anthony with this question about 
some of the, the other aspects of working lands, working lands funding, but what, what are the other opportunities and or challenges that they're facing right now? And Anthony, don't forget to unmute, please. <laughs> well, David, first, before I go there, I wanted to just mention one other thing to follow up on what Carolyn Partridge was talking about. There's also been a significant amount of money put towards hunger programs, which is obviously really important. About $21 million of COVID of CARES money went to hunger programs. If we can direct most of that money or more of that money than we have in the past towards buying local food to feed local Vermonters, that would be useful as well. Mm -hmm. because there's a lot of people, and one of the most striking things about this whole experience has been I think not just for me, but for others as well, was seeing all those cars lined up with Vermonters, our neighbors, waiting in line for free food. It was really quite shocking to see how food insecure we were as Vermonters and living in an agricultural state that cherishes our landscape and our farm so much. So I think that in terms of the working landscape, there's two ways of looking at it. One is that the Working Lands Program helps keep land open, obviously, which is important to our, our rural economy, but really important to tourism and the way Vermont looks, the landscape, which is really important to all of us. But we have to make sure that the landscape is used in a way that generates profit, that makes farming agricultural, that makes farming viable as well. And I think that's the most important role that it plays. It's also important to keep in mind with Working Lands that it's not just about the farming itself, it's about marketing and processing. And I think we need to do more and Working Lands is the place to make that happen to make sure that we have processing plants and processing opportunities that allow farmers to extend their seasons and put out a variety of products that are not just raw but processed as well. And I think that Working Lands is the place to go to get that kind of funding, also to build marketing, marketing infrastructures and networks so that we can make sure that food gets to people who need it, whether it's commercial operations like restaurants or hunger programs as well. We really need to do more to design a strong network of agricultural production and marketing in the state so that we can have a food system that really works for all of us. You know, we really saw the weakness of this, one of the weaknesses of this pandemic showed us was how weak, how food insecure we are and how vulnerable different parts of our economy are. So it's really important that we will look to programs like Working Lands Fund to provide grants to people who are gonna do processing plants and marketing efforts as well. Because we, you know, growing food is one part of it, but getting it to people who need it, whether it's commercially or nonprofit, is really important as well. The working lands is a place to make that happen. Carolyn, uh, Representative Partridge, can you touch on uh, a little more about working lands? You did actually start to in in your uh, earlier remarks, but maybe go into a little more detail. I I can get very excited about working lands. Um, I I say, and no offense to the folks in South Burlington or Williston, but People come to here to, to the state of Vermont to uh, enjoy our working landscape, um, not to look at the subdivisions in Williston and South Burlington. Um, so it's critically important. And you mentioned the towns that I represent, which are Athens, Brookline, Grafton, part of Northwest Minster, all of Rockingham and my hometown of Wyndham. And right now I'm looking out over Turkey Mountain, which used to be owned by international paper. Um, so it's huge. I, the town of Wyndham is mostly forested. And in fact, when you look at the entire state, 75% uh, of it is forested, 20% is in agriculture. So 95% of our land is in, um, is in working land. So it is hugely important. Um, we know, and, and there are all these external values as well in terms of you know, forestry, clean water, um, and, and ag has taken a hit uh, from some folks because of um, the water pollution in Lake Champlain. But in fact, agriculture is taking on 67% of the cleanup. So while they were you know, uh, estimated to be responsible for 41% of the problem, 46% um, of our emissions, our carbon emissions are offset by our forests. So those are some of the other things that make this so important. So um, there is $5 million, by the way, in a forest economy stabilization grant. And, um, you know, again, those, I believe that you can start to apply for that, those grants, but the, you, you know, the final details may not have been completely worked out. So working lands are incredibly important. Uh, I like what uh, Anthony was saying. We all eat, you know, most of us eat at least three times a day. And so our farms are incredibly important. Um, they've potentially, well, we know that some of them have taken a huge hit. We know forestry has taken a hit. 
because of the closure of some of the low grade wood mills in Maine. Um, we could use some infrastructure to help there. Um, but I think that there is a great opportunity, and this is what I'm really excited about, so I'm really hoping I get reelected in November, or actually, you know, start with August, August 11th primary, please people vote, uh, if not before August 11th, on August 11th. But I'm really excited about talking about a regional food supply system. I think it offers great opportunity for our farmers and, um, and for the region as a whole, because one of the things that this pandemic has done is given us a wake up call and revealed the cracks in our food supply chain system. And uh, I, I see this as a huge opportunity. It's one of the reasons I'm pretty um, uh, supportive of dairy because I think of all the states around us, there are none that actually produce the dairy that they need. I think Maine may be the one that is neutral. It produces what it needs, but all of the other states do not. And that would be potentially our contribution or, or one of our contributions. There'd be many contributions um, to the food supply system. Uh, I am aware that there is a Massachusetts state senator who has reached out to um, the chair of Senate Ag regarding uh, a, a meat supply. So I'm seeing opportunities and I know that there are people talking about it. This is what I, if I'm uh, reelected and appointed as chair of House Agriculture and Forestry, this is one of the things I wanna be focused on next biennium. Yeah, it does seem like Vermont has a real marketing potential, whether it's forest products, uh, dairy, other agricultural products and value-added products are very strong value-added products sector to these really geographically close markets of Boston, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey. In many ways, it's a real advantage uh, that with some leadership we could take advantage of uh, relative to if we lived in Northwest Nebraska or out in Wyoming or Idaho or something. Um, Graham, did you wanna add some about some of the other aspects of working lands and uh, the working lands economy? What are the challenges? What are the opportunities? Yeah, thank you, everybody. Um, you know, express broad agreement with, with what's been said here so far, uh, in particular, um, Chair Partridge's discussion of the importance of a regional food system, regional working lands initiatives and cooperation, sort of recognizing that interdependence and the different assets we all bring um, to support one another, could bring to really leverage in that conversation. And I think as we're talking about essential workers, we need to really recognize that an equitable and environmentally sound working lands economy and the infrastructures and systems which support it, as Anthony was referring to, is, is essential as well. It'll be the foundation of our economic and cultural future in a world affected by climate change and social, economic, political, political disruptions. Um, and, and hopeful that you know, we can all work to base this economy on principles and a vision of resource and food sovereignty, um, which is accessible, is inclusive, which can carry viable business opportunities for small scale, local, regional producers. And also the education around the skills necessary to engage in the working lands must be a core part of our educational system. And that's something I know we've been thinking about more and more at rural Vermont is, um, is what role does the working lands economy and the skills related to it play in our, in our food system, in our, in our education system and how are youth being prepared and offered opportunities to really engage and be a part of that future. I think also, um, you know, the non, Direct ag issues could really support the working lands economy. And I know rural Vermont and Nova Vermont and some other ag organizations um, are joining sort of this collaborative push for, in the absence of a federal initiative, you know, working at the state and regional levels to assure a publicly funded universal health care, child care, and other basic needs are met. And um, we've seen evidence, we've seen studies showing this will bring more working lands families, businesses, and individuals to Vermont. It will increase the viability of existing operations, it will increase mental health. Um, and I think that some of those broader social economic support policies, we could also really approach at a regional level and they could make a significant difference in, in folks' lives and what the working land economy looks like here. In particular, when we think about the historical inequities which this food system and working land economy is founded on, uh, referring to racism, patriarchy, you know, classism, and, and really trying to reconcile and reckon with, with what that means and work with those communities to really the vision and um, the turn of the future. And I would just shout out Farm to Plate Network as well here. I think that's been a great initiative 
uh, which a number of organizations and legislature have worked on over the past 10 years. It's just been reauthorized. It's a great space for this, this conversation to continue. It's sort of a, a network with nodes of groups which focus on different aspects of the food system, the working lands economies. Anybody can plug in. Um, and I know as an organization, we found it super helpful. Um, and perhaps the last sort of thing I'd say here is um, and, you know, a number of opportunity we see for equity and opportunity in working lands uh, in immediate legislative opportunity is with uh, the tax and regulate bill related to this. Um, and currently, you know, Vermont, rural Vermont, Montrose Association, Justice for All and Trace um, are working to oppose S54. We really think this could be an opportunity to direct funding towards reparations for communities who have been impacted by the war on drugs, systemic racism, um, and as an opportunity to really provide some other opportunities for small farms and farmers in Vermont. Um, and we really hope that this bill will let it die in conference committee this fall and we'll have an opportunity to create a just and inclusive process for drafting a new bill focusing on racial justice and agricultural equity going forward. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, we're nearing the end of the program. Obviously, there's a lot of different topics to discuss in the world of working lands. It is, as Representative Partridge said, you know, 90, 95% of the landscape of Vermont, when you include the forestry, as well as the uh, other wood products and maple, and then you've got dairy, diversified agriculture, animal husbandry, and so forth. Um, so as we wrap up and before we end, I want to just give each of you a, a minute or two to share any other thoughts, suggestions, or questions, needs that, uh, you know, we didn't cover in this brief program, this very brief conversation. Uh, so uh, I'll start in my original order, uh, Representative Partridge, maybe you could go first with any other pieces that, uh, that we didn't address. Uh, well, one thing that I'm really concerned about, and I, um, you know, I come at this from somebody who back in the eight, early 80s worked at um, Harlow Farm, Harlow uh, Vegetable Farm, which is an organic farm in Westminster West for Paul Harlow, and not Westminster West, but Westminster for Paul Harlow. Uh, and that is labor. And we've referred to it tangentially a bit today. And I, I have, you know, I'm a strong supporter of the H2A program, which um, is, is fabulous. It's been in place since the 40s. Um, and I just wish, um, and, but this has to be dealt with, I think, on a federal basis. Um, I just wish that we could come to some kind of um, uh, place where we we understand as a country, I think the state pretty much understands this, but we can understand as a country how important labor is and and how we should be um, appreciating the folks who come from other countries to harvest our food that feed us and how those folks should be treated fairly, they should be paid fairly, they should be given health care we should all be given health care. Graham mentioned that earlier. Um, but I, <clears throat> I, I think about uh, several years ago when Alabama passed some really strict laws about um, uh, undocumented workers and everybody fled to Florida. And all of a sudden there were acres and acres of tomatoes that, never got, um, that never got harvested because there was nobody to harvest them. And I just can't understand how people, you know, how people could be so wrongheaded about our policies regarding um, the folks who come and harvest our fields. So um, that's my little thought. Uh, and I, you know, I don't have an easy answer because I think it is a national issue, um, but it's something that I think we should think about and honor as we, um, as we move forward. Well, thank you, uh, Carolyn. And I know some of those issues with respect to farm workers is, those that work on dairies with year-round jobs are not eligible for the H-2A program, whereas those exactly. that are um, seasonal workers are. Uh, and, you know, I'll just folks to know, you know, we have three folks who work on our farm through the H-2A program, which has actually brought all the wages up. Uh, the H-2A program is a prevailing wage set rate. And so those folks are getting $14.29 uh, an hour now, which means the bottom pay anywhere on the farm is $14.29, uh, which for a lot of farms, that would be really hard to do. And it is a pinch point, but uh, you know we're seeing potentially more and more local folks who may be interested in farm jobs if wages were higher or if there was universal health care and some of these other pieces that um, 
our society has let go by the wayside. Uh, Anthony, do you want to offer any other thoughts uh, as you as we wrap the program here? I, I want to also just underscore what you two have been saying about workers and the need to respect farm workers. It's interesting that in our culture, people who do some of the most important work, whether it's growing our food, taking care of our kids, taking care of the elderly, are expected to do it for low pay and no benefits. And I think it's really important that we give more respect to our farm workers, going back to one of the things Graham initially mentioned about making sure that the farm workers get payments the same way other low income workers have gotten payments over time. And I think we need to make sure that that happens. I don't want to sound like a cliche, but I would say that I think that COVID-19 is a challenge, obviously, but I think that's also provides us an opportunity because it is showing some of the holes in our safety net when it comes to the kinds of services that Vermonters need. And it showed the volatility of our agriculture as well. And I think it's, we see that as an opportunity to take a hard look at our agricultural economy and see where the holes are in that economy, where the weaknesses are, where the vulnerabilities are, and find ways to strengthen it. And that means, to me, it means taking advantage of the opportunities to build a farm a food system here in the state of Vermont that works for us, but also underscoring what was said earlier about the need for the possibility of Vermont providing food to the New England region. There was a study done, a survey, a consumer survey done a number of years ago of people in the Boston area who said that they would pay significantly more for food products that they consider to be local and sustainably raised. And they said that they believe that Vermont farmers actually represented their local agriculture. So they were willing to pay more for Vermont products if they were sustainably raised and marketed at a, in a way that provided farmers a fair return on their labor, which I think is really important. So there are those opportunities there. The last thing I would just mention is that the other big issue that we deal with a lot in the legislature and in our daily lives, and one of the big issues that's hanging over all our decision making these days is climate change. And there's no doubt that a strong agricultural economy has used the, more improvement around sustainable agricultural practices as part of any Green New Deal as we move forward. We need to reduce our carbon emissions. Forests are an important part of doing that, but growing food in a sustainable way is an important part of doing that. So I think as we talk about a Green New Deal for the state of Vermont, which I think we will do more and more in the days to come, with the right kind of leadership, we'll not only get a Green New Deal in terms of energy, consumption and carbon emissions, but the Green New Deal will actually include a strong agricultural economy as well. So I appreciate you being a, being a part of this discussion about that. Absolutely. And uh, Graham, do you have some thoughts on uh, other last bits you want to add? You got a lot in that last one, which is great. Any other pieces that you left out? Um, yeah, I think, you know, I appreciate what Representative Partridge and, and Senator Polina said here. And I, we do recognize, you know, that disasters in general are can be points of opportunity. And I think Naomi Klein writes about this as well. And I think we all need to be aware that there are points of opportunity for all different types of forces. And we've seen that at the federal level. And I think we see our representatives at the state level really trying to work for our for the people who live here right now. And I, so, you know, I think what I'd just like to stress here is um, also taking a little bit of a lead from our international allies. So we've really been trying to affirm our relationships with International Peasant Movement, um, which is essentially a working lands movement internationally based in peasant agriculture called La Via Campesina, as well as our national partners like the Family Farm Coalition, because we can really see, you know, what's happening around the world and how we're a piece of that. And it helps us understand how to be in solidarity with folks and understand our own positionality uh, and how to prove our position. So, you know, I think just to sum it up, you know, we've been a Vermont and regional food system based on the principles of food sovereignty that must address historical and current discrimination and inequities. And which is resilient to the various threats we'll face from pandemics, as Senator Felina talks about climate change and social, economic, political system disruption. And we have the opportunities right now to allocate that $5 million in COVID relief payments to migrants living in Vermont, to restore equity to the funding process for non dairy and dairy farms, to assure that farmers' markets are treated equitably, and you know, to work on a, on a more equitable tax and regulate bill going mm -hmm. forward with our, our racial justice allies um, and with agricultural stakeholders as well. Well, great. Um, I do want to thank all three of you, uh, everyone who is watching. Uh, it's really been informative, I think, uh, both from the legislative perspective and from Graham's perspective with rural Vermont with uh, robust and uh, informative information. I do host, as we said at the outset, regular conversations here about different issues that the legislature's worked on and issues that Vermonters uh, have expressed an interest in. So if you have ideas or topics you feel should be discussed, please feel free to reach out. You can also see some of our past conversations by visiting the events page on my website, zuckerman4vt.com. Uh, 
There's details also about some future conversations coming up in the next uh, few, few days and weeks, uh, recordings and videos of past virtual events. And of course, you can also find those videos on my Facebook page and on the YouTube pages at Zuckerman for VT. Uh, if you've got additional thoughts and topics, please reach out. You can email us at info at Zuckerman, F-O-R-V-T dot com. And again, uh, thank you, uh, Chairperson Representative Partridge, uh, Senator Anthony Polina, and Graham uh, from rural Vermont. I really appreciate your taking some time to join us today.